test your knowledge with a brand new trivia game that we're offering today. It's really easy to play along. Just follow the link that we've already shared in the chat. Ian, our game show host, Ian Rapnicki, along with Christian Black, will be walking you through the process on how to get started. If you have a question on that process, please leave us a public comment on this YouTube page uh, by logging in using your Gmail account or a public comment on the Facebook page. Now, to get us started, please welcome Ian and Christian. Hi, guys. Hey, thanks, Hello. Amanda. Um, yeah, if you're a regular to the Thursdays at the Museum program, you may have played DI Bingo with us in the past, uh, but today we're trying out a new way to hopefully have some fun while we engage with the DIA's collection. Um, here to help the game run smoothly is DIA Gallery Teacher, Trivia Wizard, Christian Black. <laughs> Christian's yes. going to give a, a rundown on how to play along today. And then we'll be checking in with him periodically. He'll let us know how the leaderboard looks as we play. So how do we play, Christian? Well, um, the way we would play, first and foremost, if you are using your laptop, uh, you would open up a new tab on your browser page. And you would type in crowd.live um forward slash r c l k f the link that you see here uh, on your screen uh and that will allow you to enter in your name or you can put in a nickname um if you like and that will get you into the game also if you have a smart device your tablet or your smartphone you can actually take your camera on your phone just uh go to the qr code uh, that you see here, this box, and just take a picture of it, and you should be able to enter the game that way. Cool. Yeah, so it's it's pretty simple. We'll keep that code flashing. If you um, need some extra time or you're jumping in just now, just you can go to this link crowd per, but we'll have that in the chat for you as well. Um, the key is to maybe keep a separate tab open if you if you don't have two devices so you can hear us talk as you play. Um, of course, if you don't have the ability or the interest in going to the app, um, you can just walk watch along as we play and uh, shout at the screen, shout your answers at the screen, like you might when you watch Jeopardy or something, but know that you won't be eligible for prizes. We do have some prizes to play for today. Um, here we have an assortment of DIA publications uh, that you can play to win. Uh, we'll give you a choice. Uh, if you are the winner, we'll get your contact info from you um, in the comments or the chat, or we'll have you email us. We'll get in touch with you somehow, and we'll ship one of these books to your door. Uh, here we've got the Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in Detroit, or we've got Frederick Church, A Painter's Pilgrimage, which is an exhibition catalog. Um, we've also got the Detroit Style Car Design in the Motor City, 1950 to 2020. Um, all great books. Um, if you've got one, no worries. You can tell us you want a different one, and we'll send it to you. Um, all right. How are we looking? Do we have players logging in, Christian? Yes, we do. We currently have nine play, uh, nine players here. Okay. Well, that's a good start and a good enough start to um, maybe jump into the game. For those who are just kind of browsing past now and seeing uh, what we're doing here, you can join in the uh, join the link in the chat and jump on the game with us. Uh, but those who are already in will get a little bit of a head start on the point board. So. We're going to play multiple categories today with a few questions, each relating to an object in the DIA's collection. The first category is saw it on screen. This will focus on artworks in the collection that relate in some way to movies or TV. OK, here we go. Question number one, um, Jim Henson 
created the DIA's Kermit the Frog puppet in 1969. Around the world, Kermit goes by many names. Which of the following names is not one of the names that Kermit goes by? Does he not go by Lorana Gustavo, Kamel, Kokas, or Gunther Grun? You have 20 seconds. The longer you take, the fewer points you get. So which of these names is Kermit not known as around the globe? Lorana Gustavo, Kamel, Kokas, or Gunther Grun? Five seconds remaining. And time's up. The correct answer is Gunther Grun. Uh, Kermit debuted as a vaguely lizard-like creature in 1955 on a show called Sam and Francis. Um, it wasn't until the creation of this puppet, our puppet, in 1969, that Kermit began to close, uh, closely resemble a frog that we know him to, as today. Um, so this, the collar that you see on there, that kind of frilly collar, was actually intended to conceal the seam at the neckline there. But uh, some of you might have recently seen Kermit. He's been out on display relatively recently, but he spends most of his time in a dark and safe place at the museum to preserve his uh, his color and his, keep him safe. But maybe he'll be out again at some point in the future, I'm sure. All right, hopefully you're getting the hang of this. Hopefully you figured out the buttons. We're gonna move on to question two, which is a replica of this painting by Kehinde Wiley was featured in what hit show? Was it Empire, Modern Family, Gossip Girl, or Keeping Up With The Kardashians. Again, there's a replica of this painting that's in the DIA's collection by Kehinde Wiley that was featured in a hit show. Was it Empire, Modern Family, Gossip Girl, or Keeping Up With The Kardashians? Make your selections. You have five seconds and time's up. The correct answer is a empire and you can see a still from the show on the screen a, re a reproduction of the painting hangs in an office throughout the first season of empire um, a rider about the painting itself a rider mounted on a horse is a classic position in art history and it's meant to convey victory power and even the strength of the rider and in paintings like this Wiley inserts young African-Americans into a tradition that previously excluded them. Moving on to the third question in Saw It On Screen, the question is, this painting in the DIA's collection is by an artist whose work was also featured prominently in season two of AMC's Mad Men. Which artist is this painting by? Is it Willem de Kooning, Mark Rothko, Jackson Pollock, or Joan Mitchell? So a painting by this artist that's in the DIA's collection was featured on season two of AMC's Mad Men. Which artist is it? De Kooning, Rothko, Pollock, or Mitchell? Five seconds remaining. And the correct answer is B, Mark Rothko. Uh, this is from 1963 called, well, ours is called Orange Brown from 1963. The one you're seeing in the image and the one you saw on screen in the television show Mad Men was a, a fake Rothko. Um, you can see people, employees of in, in Burt Cooper's office, they're gazing upon the, his new Rothko that he was showing off in his office. Um, you can see the real thing at the DIA in part of, as a part of our collection. Uh, Mad Men featured other famous artworks like Jackson, Jackson Pollock had a painting hanging in Burt Cooper's office as he was watching the moon landing in season seven. So clearly a guy with expensive taste. Uh, let's get our last question of the category, saw it on screen. 
And the question is, a sculpture from ancient Mexico in the DIA's galleries takes the form of what animal that traveled with Miguel into the afterlife in Disney's Coco? Was it a bird, a dog, a jaguar, or a snake? So the DI is a sculpture in our ancient Mexican galleries that takes the form of an animal, the same animal that traveled with Miguel into the afterlife in the film Coco. Is that animal a bird, a dog, a jaguar, or a snake? All right, time's up. Answer is B. It's a dog seen here on the presentation screen. This is a, a dog made of clay with red slip. It dates from somewhere between 200 BCE and around 300 CE. So it's somewhere around 2000 years old. And ceramic sculptures of hairless dogs have been found in pre-Columbian burial sites throughout Western Mexico. They were believed to act as guides for souls into the uh, on their journey into the afterlife, just like we saw in the very beautiful movie Coco. All right, we've made it through one category. Uh, four questions in. I'm wondering how the scoreboards looking, Christian. Well, um, the scoreboards, as you can see, the first play, our first place uh, winner so far is MP with a score of 275. Second place is Carrie C. Uh, with 118, and third place is Carol, uh, Carolyn, which ha uh, who has a score of 157. Still anybody's game here. Um, fourth, uh, our fourth place uh, um, participant, rather, um, is not that far behind from our third, so this is still anybody's game. Absolutely. We've got several more categories. Um, for those who are just tuning in or scrolling past us and wanting to join, there's plenty of time to catch up. Um, you just follow the link in the chat, or if you're uh, looking at the presentation now, there's a QR code that you can use there. Um, sorry, it was a different screen. Um, there we are, the leaderboard there. At the bottom of the leaderboard, you've got a QR code. Um, you've also got that code that you can use at crowd.live. Enter the code RCLKF to join this game, enter your username and play along. We're very early in the game yet. And just a reminder, the faster you are, the more points you earn. So the quicker you get your answer in, the more points you get. So that's one technique to get ahead here. All right, let's move on to category two, which is stories in art. So here we'll be looking at images, artworks from the DI's collection that are associated with uh, with stories, <laughs> which is a lot of them. Well, we've got four of them here. All right. So question number one, category two. This Greek mythological figure is said to have opened a jar, releasing evil onto the world. Was that figure Pandora, Aphrodite, uh, Miss, <laughs> I love saying this, uh, Mephistopheles, or Helena. All right. Which mythological figure seen here is said to have opened a jar releasing evil onto the world? Pandora, Aphrodite, Mephistopheles, or Helena? Time's up. And the answer is a Pandora. This is a sculpture of Pandora from 1864. Uh, you've probably heard of Pandora's box, uh, but the Greek word pithos uh, from Pandora's story was mistranslated at some point as box. So you've probably heard of Pandora's box, but actually uh, pithos refers to a large jar. So if you're trying to avoid confusion, maybe you can just stick with the, the idiom about a can of worms instead of Pandora's box. Um, let's look at another story in art. This one um, 
you see here, this female artist of uh, one of the most famous Italian painters of the 1600s created the work Judith and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes. The artist's name also refers to the Greek goddess of the moon. What's the artist's name? Is it Athena, Pandora, Artemisia, or Persona, uh, Pers <laughs> Persephone? Sorry. This is really testing my pronunciation. Uh, what is the name of the female artist of this artwork on your screen? Was it Athena, Pandora, Artemisia, Persona, Persephone? Uh, the name also refers to the Greek goddess of the moon. What is it? Two seconds, time's up. The answer is Artemisia. Uh, the image you're seeing on the screen was painted somewhere around 1623 to 1625, oil on canvas. Um, as I said, Artemisia is derived from the Greek Artemis, who was the goddess of the moon. Um, relatedly, some scholars point to the crescent moon-shaped shadow that's on Judith's face in this image, combined with the presence of initials GG on the back of the canvas, as possible clues that Genelesky was familiar with the work of astronomer Galileo Galilei. So maybe a more moon references than we're even certain of in this. Let's tell another story. A folding screen in the DIS collection depicts events from what is often called the world's first novel written over a thousand years ago. What is the name of that novel? Is it The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikabu? Is it The Odyssey by Homer? Is it Lisa Strata by Aristophanes? Or is it Meno by Plato? Again, we've got a folding screen in the DI's collection that depicts events from what is often called the world's first novel. What's the name of that novel? Three seconds left. And time's up. The name of that novel is Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. And that's a, it's in our Japanese galleries at the museum when it's displayed. Um, it's called Spring and Summer Palace Gardens from the Tale of Genji. It's 17th century six panel folding screen. Um, the novel is a work of Japanese literature written in the early 11th century. Um, yeah, let's look at another story. Let's keep the stories flowing. Stories in art. Uh, this painting, reading of the story of Inoni, was the first artwork to enter our collection. Tragically, the artist lost his life in which famed disaster? Was it the sinking of the Titanic, the Hindenburg explosion, the Spanish flu, or the 1906 San Francisco earthquake? The artist responsible for this artwork, the first in the DI's collection, lost their life in a famed disaster. Which one was it? Five seconds remain. All right, time's up. And the correct answer is A, the sinking of the Titanic. Um, the painting we were looking at was from 1883. The first artwork accessioned by what became the DIA. It was painted by Francis Davis, Davis Millet, who died on April 15th, 1912, same day the Titanic sank, allegedly last seen helping women and children into lifeboats. What a guy. And that brings us to the end of our second category. How's the leaderboard looking now, Christian? Well, let's see here. Um, what we have here, we have, there's been a shift. Uh, our first place um, contestant is now Carrie C with 545 points. Our second place is MP with 485. 
Uh, our third place is Emma L, who has 374, with fourth and fifth uh, coming right behind Emma. Uh, so still anybody's game. Uh, but yes, we there's definitely a the gap is ever closing in between third, fourth, and fifth. Okay, we're not even halfway through, so there is time for some more change on that leaderboard. Um, again, you, if you're just joining us, you can uh, follow the QR code at the bottom left of the leaderboard there, or go to crowd.live and enter RCLKF to create a username or uh, just a nickname and join the game and play along. Lots of time to catch up. Um, if you have any questions, don't forget that you can leave a public comment. If you're on Facebook, you can comment there. If you're on uh, YouTube, if you're watching live on YouTube, you, you'll have to be logged into your your Gmail account, but there you can also leave a comment if you need to. Um, hopefully everybody's feeling good so far. We're gonna shake it up now with another category. And that category is, it's a zoo in here. These are questions that relate to artworks depicting animals at the DIA. The first one is, this image of Mushushu Dragon, symbol of the god Marduk, adorned the Ishtar Gate of the city of Babylon. Which of the fallen creatures is uh, does not lend its features to the representation of the dragon? So out of these choices, which one don't you see in this image? Do you not see a serpent, fish, lion, or scorpion? Three out of the four are, are there. One of them is not. Which one don't you see? You've got 10 seconds to, to lean in and get a close look. <laughs> All right. There you go. And I think time's up. The answer is B, fish. Um, Again, this is um, a piece from the Ishtar Gate. Uh, the molded and glazed baked brick image you see was made somewhere between 604 and 562 BCE. Pretty old, uh, over 2,500 years old, actually. Um, and it was part of a grand procession way that led into the ancient city of Babylon. Uh, it was constructed of un, uh, using glazed brick that featured alternating rows of, of reliefs depicting dragons, bulls, and lions representing the gods uh, Marduk, Adad, and Ishtar, respectively. Um, in the image you're seeing on the screen now, um, you do see a fish, so that might be confusing to you, but. Uh, that's just Photoshop. That's just a Photoshop joke there for you. It's got a fish tail. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, next question in animals in art. Uh, this mixed media painting by Detroit artist Charles McGee is inspired by which biblical story? Was it uh, Noah's Ark, Jonah and the Whale, Daniel in the Lion's Den, or the snake in the Garden of Eden. This mixed media painting by Detroit artist Charles McGee is inspired by which biblical story? Noah's Ark, Jonah and the Whale, Daniel and the Lion's Den, or the snake in the Garden of Eden? Time's almost up. Ding, ding, ding. Correct answer is Noah's Ark. This piece called Noah's Ark Genesis uh, was created in 1984 by Charles McGee, who recently passed away. Um, this piece is pretty fun to explore in person because it's made of all sorts of different materials, um, including rope, paper, mud cloth. There's an actual uh, bumblebee that's glued to the surface there too. Do I have an animation here? Oh, there it is. 
there's actual bumblebees. So this is a, a very large piece um, compared to the way it looks on your screen. And so you can see these textures and shadows and details in person. And it's pretty incredible. And it's, it's on view at the museum now. So come on down and check it out. All right. Still looking at animals in art. But now we'll look at this. And the question is, uh, red pigment found in this hat was made from the scaly beetle cochineal used for centuries in a variety of products. In which of these products are you not likely to find cochineal used today? Will you find cochineal in lipstick, Swedish fish, yarn, or frozen meat? There's three of those you're likely to find it. One of those you're not likely to find cochineal used as a red pigment. Which one won't you find cochineal in? Lipstick, Swedish fish, yarn, frozen meat. Time's almost up. Ding, ding, ding. B. The answer is B, Swedish fish. Um, the cochineal beetle produces an acid to deter predators. When an acid is mixed with aluminum or calcium salts, it produces a dye that's been widely used in stuff like garments, um, that pre-Columbian hat that I had on the screen a moment ago. Um, you, you'll find it in frozen meat and lipstick, uh, but supposedly Swedish fish don't use it. So um, if you're not a fan of eating uh, beetle acid dyes, then go get some Swedish fish and enjoy those carefree. All right, let's keep moving. This ancient Costa Rican artwork featuring the likeness of a parrot resembles a seat. But what would likely have, uh, what would have been used for? It resembles a seat, but what would it have been used for? Is it um, a grinding, is it used for grinding maize, sharpening blades, displaying fruit, or supporting ahead during sleep. Is the clock ticking on this one? It is, okay. Costa Rican object featuring the likeness of a parrot. Looks like a seat. What was it used for? Grinding maize, sharpening blade, displaying fruit, supporting head while sleep times up. Okay. <laughs> the answer is grinding maize. Uh, this is a Costa Rican um, matate and it's from somewhere between 500 and 1,000, the years that is. So it's 1,500 to uh, 1,000 to 1,500 years old, made out of volcanic rock. Um, a matate is a ground stone tool typically used in the grinding of organic materials during food preparation. Uh, some of the more carefully carved matates may have been created for use as burial objects as well. And, um, in our ancient American galleries, you can find a few examples of uh, metates, including this one. So get a look at it up close. It's pretty cool. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of the animal round. So once again, here, Christian Black will update us on that leaderboard. All right, so we have uh, first place, Carrie C, still holding strong with 693. Uh, second place is MP with 658, so not that far away. MP is definitely catching up. Uh, Emma L is third place with 605, still have uh, plenty of opportunity to catch up. With yet again, uh, fourth and fifth uh, being um, Sue and Carolyn uh, being close up as well. Yeah, it is a pretty close game. Um, a reminder, as if you needed it, the faster you answer, the better. Um, in this game, the quicker you, you answer, the more points you tally up. So hesitation, no hesitation will result in better scores for you. 
Um, newcomers can still join. You never know what'll happen. Maybe Carrie C's internet will go down or she'll, yeah, she'll lose her, her service and won't answer another one the rest of the game. So you could always join now and still catch up because we have plenty more questions. Um, all right. Again, at the bottom of the screen, there's still that QR code you can join at any time. Um, next category is blue artworks that uh, some way relate to the color or blue in some other way. We'll find out. Um, get a little teaser there for the next question, but it is this 1902 painting, Melancholy Woman, is an example of a work from which famous artists blue blue period um, is it by Henri Matisse Pablo Picasso Thomas Dewing or Amadeo Modigliani 1902 painting melancholy woman is an example of a work from which famous artists blue period Henri Matisse Pablo Picasso Thomas Dewing uh, Amadeo Modigliani and the correct answer is B, Pablo Picasso. Um, uh, although Pablo Picasso is known to have used a wide array of colors throughout his long and prolific career, between 1901 and 1904, Picasso painted essentially monochromatic paintings in shades of blue or blue-green and only occasionally used uh, warmed, warmer other colors. Um, you can get a sense of the variety of, of techniques in different kind of periods Picasso went through when you visit the museum. We have a great collection spanning earlier in his career like we see here to uh, more uh, famous or iconic images from his uh, more cubist periods and beyond. And it's really special to see those on the wall next to each other so you can see how he experimented with different styles and his um, never really just stuck with one thing throughout his really long career all right color blue question two um, here uh, the painting eleonora of toledo and her son by bronzino features a background that was originally blue, but now the background appears gray. For this reason, does it appear gray because Eleonora's husband, Cosimo I, did not like blue? Was it because the painting was modified to commemorate Eleonora's death? Was it a bad restoration in the 1950s? Or was an inexpensive pigment used that has now discolored. Why was the blue background uh, turned gray? Why is it turned gray? <laughs> All right. The answer is D, an inex inexpensive pigment was used that's now discolored. Uh, our painting painted between 1545 and 1550 is one of several similar state portraits created by Bronzino. To save some money, in the DIA's version, Bronzino didn't use ultramarine blue, which holds its color pretty well. Instead, opted to use ground glass pigment called smalt, uh, made with blue cobalt. The color faded over time, and now the background is nearly gray. Um, here you'll see it with a bright blue background depicted closer to maybe what it originally looked like. A version, a different version of the painting with, with an ultramarine blue background is now in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Uh, so we got the cheap one, but still very impressive image, very skillfully painted and, and really beautiful to look at in our, uh, in our galleries. Much more beautiful than on a tiny screen like you're seeing it now. Don't take my word for it. Go check it out. 
let's check out the next question. Color blue. This 1950 painting by Huey Lee Smith depicts the shallowest Great Lake. Which Great Lake is it? Is the shallowest Great Lake Michigan, Huron, Erie, or Ontario? What's the shallow, shallowest Great Lake? Take a guess, um, use your prior knowledge, or look closely at that little painting and tell me what lake that is. Is that Michigan, Huron, Erie, or Ontario? All right, Michiganders, time is up. And the shallowest Great Lake is C. Lake Erie measures a modest 210 feet deep at its deepest point. This painting entitled Sunrise Over Lake Erie dates to around 1950. Um, and Huey, this is another artist that is, is fairly well represented in our collection. And you can see a variety of subjects that Huey Lee Smith has painted in his career because we have many different scenes by him in our contemporary galleries. Okay, the color blue. Next question. This Chua mask depicts Elvis Presley. Which of the following is not an Elvis song? Which song didn't Elvis sing? Blue suede shoes, blue Christmas, blue Hawaii, or blue Monday? Which of these titles is not an Elvis song? Three of them are, one of them's not. Is it suede shoes, Christmas, Hawaii, or Monday? All right, Elvis fans, you knew it. D, Blue Monday is not an Elvis song. Um, the artwork we're seeing here, which is very cool, relatively new to the DI's collection, I was really excited to see it come in, um, is also known as LVC. It's made sometime in the mid 20th century. I guess the date's not uh, that clear, but Obviously, it's it's about Elvis, Elvis Presley, so we we know it it can't be before the 1950s. Um, it's made out of wood with uh, paint on it and hair. Uh, about the songs, though, "Blue Suede Shoes" was released in 1956. That was followed by by "Blue Christmas" the next year in '57. Later on, uh, "Blue Hawaii." came out in 61. Um, Elvis also released Moody Blue in, in 77. Um, and although Fats Domino and Bl Buddy Holly released their own Blue Mondays, the most famous Blue Monday is probably New Order's Blue Monday from 1986. All right, that was a quick round. Why don't we Check back in with Christian. Yes, yes. So we have um, first place, Carrie C is holding it strong. Um, she is um, definitely making sure she stay ahead of the pack. Uh, second place is MP. Um, MP has 842. Um, we have third is Carolyn. Carolyn is third place. So we see that Carolyn has uh, shifted back up to the top with 826. Emma L has nine, uh, nine, 797 and Sue has 725. So Sue, and, uh, Emma, Sue, Emma, and Carolyn are all fighting for that third place slot and Carrie is holding strong with 966. But MP can still make it, uh, make it in and get that first place in this final round. Absolutely. Yes, we have one more round. Um, and yeah, it really is anyone's game. If uh, Carrie misses a beat, she might lose that number one seat. Um, but we'll see what happens in category five. Anything can go. 
art movements is that category. Art movements. Uh, these are artworks that somehow uh, relate to movement. <laughs> uh, the first one of those is uh, partially seen on your screen here. This is a panel of uh, Diego Rivera's Detroit industry murals. Um, these panels are, these murals are really full of um, images depicting movement. As we can see, there's pushing and pulling of engine parts um, on an assembly line. So what the question is, is where are these workers depicted hard at work? What factory is seen in Rivera's Detroit industry murals? Is he depicting Dodge, Maine in Hamtramck, the Ford Highland Park plant, Buick City, Flint, or the Ford River Rouge complex in Dearborn? Which factory did Diego Rivera depict in his famous Detroit industry murals? And time is up. Answer is D, the Ford River Rouge complex. Um, when it was completed in 1928, the Rouge complex was the largest integrated factory in the world. Uh, in the summer of 1932, with Etzel Ford's support, the Mexican artist Diego Rivera was invited to study the facilities at the Rouge, and those studies uh, informed his set of murals that we know as the Detroit industry murals. Um, if any of our viewers haven't uh, visited and seen these in person, there's really no way to capture um, anything close to the experience on a, a computer screen or uh, a phone screen. Um, this is one of uh, tw I want to say 27 panels. Uh, I don't know if Christian knows that answer, <laughs> but uh, this is a, a a whole room filled. Do you do you know how many panels there are, Christian? Sorry, I called you out. Uh, you <laughs> panels. Uh, oh, I want to say it's about that number. Just okay. estimating, it's about that number. That you okay, got. cool. All right, that's all. I hope to be close to 27. Okay, so this is a room you enter in the center of the original DIA structure, um, originally a garden courtyard with a water fountain. Um, Rivera came in in the 30s and spent several months uh, putting paint on the wall. Um, so it's unlike anything else in the museum. I mean, it's part of the structure. It's painted in a fresco technique, um, which is really kind of complicated and difficult because um, a wet plasters applied to the surface uh, of the wall in small sections and before it's completely dried and cured is when that pigment has to be added and then it kind of cures into the surface of the wall and so it would be section by section by section that he would add work to fill this massive room with a glass ceiling that light shines in and looks different in different times of day depending on where the sun's shining or not shining um, so it's a really incredible experience. Um, and it, it's regarded by many, including Rivera, as uh, his most successful work. So the stories he was able to tell um, in, in Detroit are, are really some of the things that he seemed to be most proud of in his career. So we're really privileged to have that, which is why I'm blabbing on about it. There's a lot more to say. So come on down to the museum, and I'm sure somebody will tell you all about it as you look at it. But for now, let's move on to another movement question. Uh, Reginald Marsh, Marsh's Savoy Ballroom shows a group of ecstatic dancers gathered at the famed Harlem Hotspot, uh, Savoy's Ballroom. Uh, which famous dance originated at the Savoy? Oops, I just gave the answer away. <laughs> so for those who are flipping screens, you might not have seen, it's either the Foxtrot, the Lindy Hop, the Shimmy, or the Twist. Um, 
I'm feeling bad for some of you, so I just flashed the answer on the screen momentarily. Hopefully you caught it. Which famous dance originated at Savoy Ballroom? <laughs> I'm surprised we've kept it together that long uh, without making a mistake here, but ding, ding, ding. I'll show you again. The answer is the Lindy Hop B, of course. Um, the painting is, again, Reginald Marsh, Savoy Ballroom. It's from 1931, and it's Tempura on Masonite. Uh, the Savoy Ballroom was located in Harlem from 1926 to 1958. Um, many dances, such as the Lindy Hop, uh, which was named after Charles Lindbergh, and, and it originated in 1927, but many dances were developed and became famous there. And unlike, uh, unlike many ballrooms, like the Cotton Club, um, which was another famous club at the time, the Savoy always had a no discrimination policy. Um, it was said that patrons were judged on their dancing skills and not the color of their skin. Um, love this painting though it's really captures a sense of movement it's just um very energetic portrayal here and even details like the architecture there's this kind of uh arched background there and you can kind of see um horns popping up in the background imagine a band that's almost immersed in the crowd there and those arches kind of give you this sense of rhythm as you look across the the, the image there kind of bounces from one point to another. And you can just imagine the, uh, the sound here and the energy as people are dancing. Um, yeah, would have been a fun place to head out. In uh, 2021 though, it kind of looks, it looks like a little scary scene actually to me right now. I don't think I'd be going into the, the ballroom anytime soon, probably keep my distance. But when it's safe, you find me in the uh on the dance floor doing the lindy hop again all right let's hop to the next question without an answer on screen okay this suit of armor purposefully restricts the wearer's movement in order to provide protection during which contest popular in the middle ages and the renaissance um, was a suit of armor like this used for the uh for game ball <laughs> jousting fencing or shinty so again the suit of armor which if you look at it and you understand sports you might notice the functionality of it um is, is shown uh, is clear when you look at it and you know what you're looking at which sport was it game ball jousting fencing or shinty well, for those in the know, it's jousting. Um, this is a German suit of armor from around 1580. It's made of steel, copper alloy, leather, and even some paint on it. Um, features on it include a reinforced neck. So the neck is, is kind of attached to the chest. There's no movement allowed there, and that's um, intentional because in jousting where you're riding atop a horse holding a long uh, what, lance what do you call that a uh, long pole you're attempting to knock an opponent off a horse it's a very dangerous sport um, and one way to protect yourself is to keep that neck straight to avoid whiplash um, there's other clues looking at this piece what it was used for there's um, extra shoulder protection on one side that's the side that the opponent would be uh, striking um, opposite of the shoulder protection there's a little uh, kind of hook device that's designed to help hold that long weapon the hips of this are designed to allow the the wearer to ride on a horse to spread their legs so that's why it's kind of shaped that way and there's really low visibility and that's to prevent um, hurting the eyes really you're just kind of holding on tight you could look down and kind of see through the slant but when it's about time to to have impact you look back up and it protects any um, wood splinters that might fly through the air after impact from flying into your eyes so it's really specifically de designed for jousting wouldn't be great for other things um, 
Uh, and this suit of armor was actually another bit of trivia. It was a gift of the William Randolph Hearst Foundation. Um, it was purchased by Hearst uh, in 1929. Um, and Hearst's life story, as many of you might know, was the main inspiration for the lead character in Orson Welles' 1941 film, Citizen Kane. Um, and if you've seen that movie, then you know that that lead character inspired by Hearst had massive collections of art and artifacts. And um, some of those real life Hearst ar artworks ended up in the DI's collection. We actually have many suits of armor that were gifts of the Hearst Foundation. It's more than, way more than he needed. And we were the benefactor of that excess. Um, okay, here it is. This is, this is it. Um, last ditch effort, just click one as soon as you have the option. And if it's right, you'll get the most points you possibly can. If you're that desperate, that's a tech, that's just an insider tip. I don't know, probably won't work, but, uh, let's see. The last question today is why is the answer on the screen? Oh no. Oh, it's the wrong answer. So it's okay. <laughs> so ignore the answer on the screen. All right. It was the wrong answer. Um, here's the question. Just read it from here. The 2002 painting movement number 27, which is why it's in the movement category. Movement number 27 uh, depicts several symbols. Some are corporate logos and others are traditional Ghanaian symbols uh, called the Dinkra, including two crocodiles sharing one stomach. That's, um, if you look real close in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see an image of an Adinkra symbol of two crocodiles sharing one stomach. This is a symbol that intends to represent what? What does that Adinkra symbolize? Shared or common interest, honesty and trust, law and justice, or wisdom. An Adinkra symbol with two crocodiles sharing one stomach represents what? Shared or common interest, honesty and trust, law and justice, or wisdom. Three seconds remain. And the answer is, <laughs> not jousting, it's shared or common interest, A. Uh, all right, yes, we've reached the end. So the artist, uh, Ulusu Ankoma is, is a Ghanaian born artist, uh, born in 1956. The painting you're seeing is contemporary painting from 2002, um, consisting of acrylic and pencil on canvas. Um, his other works address themes of identity and the body using the trademark motif of Adinkra symbols. Um, this piece is sometimes on display in our African galleries, and sometimes it's on display um, very nearby uh, cloth works that actually show other Adinkra symbols in a, in a more traditional context. Sometimes this piece is on display in our contemporary galleries. So um, it's kind of shared in the museum and, and displayed among other contextual objects because it does fit into contemporary art it also fits into an African art narrative too. So it's really cool that our curators can find ways to, well, one that they can share, because I know I know they don't love to share, uh, but they're able to tell different stories with the same piece of art. And it's amazing how changing the context or the room that it's displayed in or what it's around can really inform how you're viewing that work of art. Um, and to that point, these works, all of them that we've seen today, are really best enjoyed when you come to the museum and see them in the galleries and you kind of explore the stories and the narratives that our curators and our interpretive team have um, shaped and presented to us to really help us have a deeper connection and deeper meaning with the works of art. Um, what we're doing today is fun and it's really intended to introduce you to a lot of different parts of the collection and test your knowledge. Of, of some of that, of uh, some of the art, test your knowledge of trivial facts from other parts of life. But really we're hoping to inspire you to, to come down to the museum and 
and see the real thing. Um, so that being said, we have a winner today and Christian is gonna announce that winner. <laughs> All right, well, our winner for today is none other than Ooh. Carrie C. Wow. Congratulations, you won with a whopping 1,217 points. Um, taking it home for today on this Thursday. Um, second place is Carolyn. Carolyn did an excellent job coming all the way from fifth place, going up to second. Uh, MP um, still was holding strong in the top three, ending in third place with 1,026 points, um, with fourth and fifth belonging to Emma and Sue, respectively. Awesome. Well, congratulations, Carrie. Um, I'm sorry I doubted you. Uh, you. You were doing great the whole time. You really even got a bigger lead there at the end, but um, still a pretty close game. Carrie, if you uh, would like to claim a prize, one of our DIA publications, um, please reach out to us. You can actually email us at uh, community engagement at dia.org there it is on your screen community engagement at dia.org and let me know let us know which publication you'd like seen here the rivera and Kahlo in detroit frederick church or detroit style for the rest of you you could still get your hands on these publications and many more at diashop.org there's lots of cool stuff there um and you can also just check back in on Thursdays regularly because we often have little bonus trivia questions at our regular lectures where you might win a prize. Um, and occasionally we play games like trivia. This was the first time, so thanks for being uh, patient with us here this, this first Thursday trivia. Um, but we also play bingo and there's always prizes involved in that. So hopefully we'll see you more often on Thursdays give out some more prizes um thank you so much christian for managing the game flawlessly no problem like, no problem i wish i managed the slideshow as flawlessly as you managed the game but I, I think we made it to the end uh pretty smoothly so thank you so much and i guess until uh next time we're gonna sign off <laughs>